Hello, everyone. Um, I would just like to, as we kind of reconvene and get to our seats, uh, share a few words about the Porter Colloquium. The James A. Porter Colloquium is the leading forum for scholars, artists, curators, and patrons of the arts in the field of African American art and visual culture. For almost 30 years, the James Porter Colloquium has remained free and open to the public. In order con to continue the impor important work that we do here in the spirit of James A. Porter, we really need your support. Please help us sustain the Porter Colloquium with financial donations. Uh, contributions can be made throughout the year, and especially today, by making a donation on our Porter website or by simply writing a personal check to Porter Colloquium, Howard University. And all contributions are tax deductible. So I'll now call our moderator for the day, Dr. Delilah Scruggs, up to introduce our artist for our artist talk. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us after lunch. Uh, now we're going to hear from Sadie Barnett on an artist's reflection on the archive. Sadie Barnett um, is from Oakland, California. She earned her BFA from CalArts and her MFA from the University of California at San Diego. Her work has been exhibited throughout the United States and internationally at venues, including the Studio Museum in Harlem the California African American Museum, the Oakland Museum of California, the Mistake Room, Self-Help Graphics, Charlie James Gallery, Evergold Projects, Papillon Gallery, Jenkins Johnson Gallery, and the Goodman Gallery in Johannesburg, South Africa. She was named one of 30 black contemporary artists under 40 that you should know by Huffington Post, and her work has been featured in several publications, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, The Guardian UK, Art Forum, Artillery Magazine, Fader, and SFAQ. Her work is in permanent collections in museums such as the Perez Museum in Miami, the California African American Museum, the Studio Museum, and in, in 2017, Sadie Barnett will have a solo exhibition at Minetti Shrem Museum of Art at the University of, San, of California at Davis. When describing her work, Barnett says, whether wor working in drawing, photography, or large scale installations, I turn my attention to the unexpected locations of identity construction. And so let us now turn our attention to Sadie Barnett. Um, please come on, welcome. Um, hello, I am Sadie Barnett, and I'd like to thank you guys so much for joining me here this afternoon um, after lunch, and thank you so much to the organizers for having me. It's really an honor to be here at Howard today. Um, my intention here is to connect different material ways of working to the overarching concepts and concerns that run through my work such as the necessity for poetry and abstraction in urban life, the power of the personal as political, um, the everyday, the living room, resistance, transcendence, and I'll mostly be focusing on recent work engaging the 500-page FBI file on my father, Rodney Barnett, that was collected because of his activity with the Black Panther Party and with Angela Davis. Um, but before I begin that project, I'd like to show how the elements of the familial, the intergenerational, and the archive were running through my work even before that project. So I'll start with three examples of that. Um, so this first photograph, um, this photograph of mine, at first it's about Malcolm X, but it's also about the object of this book itself. Um, it's embodies someone's personal, physical connection to Malcolm's ideas that you hold in your hand. And someone took the time to inscribe their name on the first page, as you can see in the top right corner. Um, in this case, it's my mother's name. So to me, this is both a portrait of Malcolm and a portrait of my mother, as well as a document on the passage of time. As you can see, the book is obviously a worn relic. And this um, is from a series of drawings I was doing during my time at Studio Museum Residency. Um, it was a series based on the names and relations in my patriarchal lineage. So 
So this is a pencil drawing using the negative space to create the text. Um, it's about 16 by 20 inches. Um, I am the great, great granddaughter of Cassandra Barnett, um, as are literally hundreds of other women. Um, I have to say it's really a great honor to say her name on this campus today. She was full-blooded Cherokee, she escaped from slavery, um, and now here I stand embodied. Um, it's a powerful, a powerful moment to, to say her name. Um, this also speaks to the specificity yet expansiveness of text, which is a device that I use often in my work. And this letter, I'm not sure how much of it you can read from your view, but it's a 1972 typewritten letter from my father uh, to his niece while he was a city college student working on Angela Davis's campaign. Um, his voice is so earnest. I mean, he's a college student. He even talks about getting college class credit for his organizing work, um, and that his teacher would let him miss some classes to organize as long as he wrote a paper about the work. Um, and he can't you know, at this time possibly know these moments, how significant they'll be to the arc of activism in the coming years. Um, they're just these moments that pass between an uncle and niece. Um, he's talking about, you know, Angela being railroaded to the gas chamber, their fundraising efforts, um, and then he ends the letter by asking about how the family's doing in Compton and says that, uh, you know, Woody came to the family party. So really, the personal and the political become one breath. Um, this image is from my studio, so beginning to talk about this FBI project. Um, the FBI, under the counterintelligence program, surveilled my father and probably some of your fathers as well. Um, my dad filed a Freedom of Information request four years ago almost five years ago now, it took about four years of back and forth to get the files. Um, and we received 500 pages of COINTELPRO surveillance. Um, immediately we recognized how intense the surveillance was. Um, there were uh, informants and provocateurs at Panther meetings. There were agents observing my dad's daily activities, um, interviewing every employer he'd ever had, interrogating his high school teacher, the little old lady next door to where he grew up, um, basically everyone he ever came into contact with that they could find. Um, nothing that my dad did was illegal. There are no criminal charges within these 500 pages, but yet he was watched for years and classified. Um, this is another view in my studio. So the first material intervention on this dossier was my adding these splashes of pink, violet, and black spray paint, both to reclaim this material as ours and to assert my authorship as a daughter looking at her father. Uh, the pages are riddled with redactions when we received them, and this is me adding um, my own layers of redactions. So when they came redacted, it really blurs the available information and lets you know how impossible it is to really construct a reality with these documents. Um, my redactions are also trying to keep something unknowable and sacred. The use of spray paint also references graffiti and tagging, um, calling in public space and also my 80s baby generation. Um, the next material intervention was to mount individual pages from the file onto uh, pink plexiglass. It's a translucent neon plexiglass, so it gets this sort of glow around the edges, as you can see here. Um, this uh, this image here is from a recent show um, called Do Not Destroy, and you can see here where the title comes from. It's this uh, officious stamp that reads, Do Not Destroy Historical Value National Archives. Um, I don't yet know at what date that was added to the original files, and if anyone has information or has um, you know, studied COINTELPRO, I'd love to talk more with you after this. 
Um, but by subverting the FBI's language and using Do Not Destroy as a title, um, I'm really trying to put it into the voice of the people's resistance, both then and now, and saying we will not be destroyed. Um, d despite the explicit aim of COINTELPRO, which was to dismantle, discredit, and destroy black organizing and leadership. And you can see above and below another material I've employed are these rhinestone gems. They're hearts, stars, diamonds, and crowns in uh, silvers, pinks, and purples. I'll talk more about that. Uh, this page here, as you can uh, hopefully read, is detailing my father and Angela Davis at the airport. So my dad was one of eight members on the National Committee to Free Angela Davis. And this here is 11 days after Angela was acquitted of all charges. Um, and there was never any charges against my dad, but they're still being uh, observed by state agents getting on an airplane at San Francisco airport. Um, these, you know, this sh very short, visceral moment really haunts me um, with how ghostly this preserved moment is, almost in the way that a photograph um, would exist. And this page is talking about my dad being labeled as a terrorist and his name being placed on ADEX category one list. The full title of this list is Emergency Apprehension and Detention Program, meaning that if your name is on this list, American citizens could be rounded up and detained without due process. Um, this is obviously unconstitutional and when the Attorney General told J. Edgar Hoover, who's really the architect of COINTELPRO, um, that it was unlawful to keep such a list, Hoover just changed the name of the list and continued the same practice. Um, some of you might have recently watched I Am Not Your Negro, and you might recall the FBI also placed Baldwin on this same securities index list, um, because we all know how dangerous writers are. Um, I mean, Hoover famously said the most dangerous thing about the Black Panther Party was the free breakfast program because he knew what a powerful tool that was to organizing the community. So you try to feed black children, you're labeled a terrorist. Um, another way that I've been using these uh, craft store crown rhinestones is to honor the dead. So this page here, you can see it's listing the leadership of the Panthers. Um, many names are redacted and those who are deceased their names are listed as followed by parentheses deceased. Um, you know, reading pages like this, I'm just very painfully aware of how lucky I am that my dad is alive. Um, so John Huggins and Bunchy Carter, listed here as Apprentice Carter, were assassinated at UCLA when they were organizing with the BSU there. Um, you know, being on a college campus today, I think sometimes we forget how young these activists were. Um, but many people lost their lives, many families were torn apart, people are still incarcerated because of their involvement with the Panthers, so I uh, never forget that and how lucky I am that my dad is able to share his story with me now. And this page is one of many detailing my dad's service in the military. So he was drafted and sent to Vietnam um, before he joined the Panthers, and I've adorned some of these pages with these, you know, ch child's craft store toy rhinestones to try to heal the trauma and show gratitude with this tiny, almost naive gesture. And here they're purple hearts because my dad received a purple heart medal while wounded in Vietnam. So this is um, an exhibition view from the show that will be opening next Thursday at UC San Diego. And you can see uh, these mounted plexi pages go along one wall and then there's um, this back wall where I wanted to juxtapose this very two-dimensional bureaucratic um, black and white text account from the FBI of my father's life um, with these photographic images that are kept and loved by family. And then the photos hang on this wallpaper, which is made up of the stamps and seals of the bureau that um, I collaged from 
within the documents. So these images are still not escaping the state's surveillance. Uh, one of the stamps, obviously it's too small for you to read, but one of the stamps reads racial interest section. It's abbreviated and it's on many, many pages. So just knowing, you know, this is something that's uh, reproduced, you know, how many stamps are on how many different desks within the Bureau um, and racial interest section in case there's any wondering why, you know, my dad is being surveilled. Um, so you, I scanned at about 600 DPI these two four inch 50 year old Polaroids and blew them up to almost life size um, to create this diptych on the left. And in the first photo, my dad wears his military uniform. And in the second photo, the iconic Panther uniform. Um, the first is from 1966 and the latter from 1968. And my dad really talks about his time um, in Vietnam, coming home and experiencing so much racism after he nearly was killed after people died in his arms. He came back to LA uh, to bury his nephew who also died in Vietnam and said that he felt like he was still in a war because of the way the police were um, conducting military operations basically in Compton, California while my dad was there to bury his nephew. Um, and this was really a major part of what catalyzed him to know that he had to do some type of organizing and that's why he joined the Black Panthers. So to me, this is really a, a before and after um, and a story of my dad's politicization. And this page here is talking about uh, the security of government employees. Um, I believe that basically because my dad was innocent of any crime, the only thing the FBI could go after was his employment as a letter carrier with the post office. You know, it's, so American. Um, my father also points out every time we talk about this that this practice is still happening today with Black Lives Matter activists um, across the country. So many um, people, after they've done uh, like a freeway, shutting down the freeway, which is a tactic that's used in Oakland with Black Lives Matter activists, uh, their employer will receive a letter uh, after that. So lest anyone think that these tactics are retro. Um, so my father was fired from his job at the post office for, quote, cohabitating with a woman who he was not married to, um, and thus displaying, quote, behavior unbecoming a government employee. Uh, this comes from a law put on the books by Truman, which is Executive Order 10450, which was initially used to get gay people fired from government jobs. Um, but here it's being used to fire my dad for cohabitating with a woman who he wasn't married to. So it's one of those examples of how laws can be used and manipulated to target whoever the government um, wants to put pressure on at that time. So we might think, oh, this law doesn't affect me. I'm not an immigrant. This law doesn't affect me. I'm not Muslim. But it can be used um, to target whoever the government deems an enemy at the time. Um, so here is his crime. Um, here he's committing this infraction. Uh, while, li while wearing the post office uniform. So it's the third uniform in this series. Um, there's a statement that my dad has within the pages of the file. Um, and you can hear his spirit of resistance and wisdom, even though, even through this like very hollowed pages of repression. So it's a statement that he gave to the, the post office when they fired him. Um, and then I'm reading it in an FBI file. So I'll read it to you now. Um, it reads, Barnett stated, it is true that I'm living with a woman I am not married to. I don't think you're going through a ritual of marriage determines the quality of relationship between man and wife. We maintain all the principles of any legal marriage. I think this is a personal thing and should be left up to the judgment of the two parties concerned in accordance with their concept of what morality is. I honestly believe that such relationship has no bad effect on anyone concerned. So in conclusion, in my eyes, we are man and wife as much as anyone else. We have one child born September 12, 1968 at Cleveland, Ohio. He has my first two names and his mother's maiden name. Um, but still, he was fired. So to move uh, throughout the exhibition going towards the left, uh, this is the next wall. So I created this wallpaper 
out of this image, um, which I achieved by re-photographing an old family portrait or family Polaroid of my, I say baby cousin because she's younger than me in this picture, although she's older than me in reality, um, in this chair and with the, like a pink plastic uh, game piece photographed on top of it. Um, so we all know this iconic photograph of Huey Newton, um, but what really interests me is what takes place after this photograph. I feel like it's inevitable there's you know, some kids running around and a kid wants to climb into the chair, um, and so I get this image. Um, and then I've tiled it here to create this wallpaper. Uh, this wallpaper is called The Living Room. And on top of the, two, of the wallpaper are these two pencil drawings. So returning to the same process as with the Cassandra's great-great-granddaughter. These are uh, rendered in hand, by hand in pencil. Uh, this is my dad's mugshot. It's the only image that appears in the file. And it appears just like this, with this posterized quality of something having been copied and recopied and copied again many times over. Um, I think of how many t you know, hands this photo passed through, um, how many desks it sat on, and how many times you have to copy a photo before it's no longer a picture of my dad and is just, quote, male black. Um, the criminalization is instant in how a mugshot functions, but by rendering this image carefully by hand in pencil, I am reclaiming the narrative from a mugshot of an extremist to a portrait of a freedom fighter. And you can see here's a detail. The actual drawing is only about four inches sitting on this uh, larger white space composition. Um, <laughs> this is the second pencil drawing, which is obviously J. Edgar Hoover's signature. Um, J. Edgar Hoover was the director of the FBI for an unparalleled 48 years, which just seems so undemocratic. Um, this drawing, I guess, is also a, a portrait of sorts. Um, and as my friend and writer, Sampada Ranke, pointed out, it's also a forgery, which I hadn't thought about while I was making it, but of course that seems so true. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the irony of very truly yours is just irresistible. Um, so this is how the signature, this is where I got the signature from within these files. Um, and it's this checklist where you can check, you know, why someone needs to be on this emergency apprehension detention list um, because they're potentially these reasons. Um, the hand you know, signature and the mark making is something that also really fascinates me within this dossier. Um, and I've placed just this one tiny pink gem under his name, uh, most because I think that would infuriate him. Um, so besides the, uh, the mug shot, there's these two, um, not exactly images, but uh, they're like pu publications that were probably taken by an informant fr who was infiltrating a Panther meeting. Um, there's at least eight informants mentioned in my dad's file alone. So there's this uh, leaflet that some of you guys might be familiar with, uh, Black Laws for All Black People. And then there's this uh, newspaper article that my dad wrote. Um, to his credit, he says if he was going to write it today, he would title it differently. I'm not so sure I would be that generous. But um, so here, again, the FBI's dossier performs as a really precious archive of my dad's papers, although it's a very dangerous and complex one. Um, this last wall of the exhibition you can see here, um, brings in my use of collage, glitter, and abstraction, as well as the element of drawing and the hand, which you can see in this um, 
large drawing here. This is about 38 by 50 inches, and it's again uh, just pencil. So each of these, you know, strokes is created after you know 100 or so hours of uh, layering and creating this texture. Um, it's really an intergenerational conversation. To me, 1968 embodies. It's just such an iconic year and embodies this, this time of struggle and change um, internationally, really. And then signing it, Love 1984, which is not only the year I was born and, and my generation, but also was sort of a, an important year in the imagination even before 1984 came to be. It was sort of thought of as the future, um, even thinking about like George Orwell's book, 1984. Um, so here, the, you know, the letter is really empty I don't exactly have the words. I don't exactly know what to say. Do you say thank you? Um, do you say I'm sorry? Um, I'm not sure, but I think by spending all of the time and labor creating this, I'm hoping that some type of uh, alchemy perhaps is created um, in the absence of, of knowing what to say. There's also this collage on that wall um, this is my dad with these two, you know, very different expressions, um, trying to, here's a, a detail, trying to allow him uh, to be a, a complex human in the ways that the FBI report really flattens him um, and allowing him to float in this free, expansive pink glitter space. Uh, this is my dad on the left. In this case, I use the actual object of the family Polaroid itself. Um, and this is him with some cousins on what I imagine would be like a Sunday afternoon. They're on this train, like a some type of like Disneyland ride. Uh, and I just wanted to have this moment of like black innocence and joy. Um, you know, this is why people are fighting. This is why my dad was organizing with the Panthers was for people's families and so people could have uh, the hope of a childhood. And this collage is my father holding me as a little baby uh, with these two, two glitter scapes, um, really liberating these figures from the expected environment, elevating them into an unknowable and unsurveillable um, imaginary black space or dream. Um, to close, I will leave you with this collage image of my dad. Um, so it's cut out photograph and spray paint on this large expanse of negative white space. Negative space is something I employ a lot. It's empty, but it's also charged um, in a way the figure is so small, but also there's so much power in something so small occupying so much space, which I think uh, sort of speaks to uh, much, of, much of the black experience. Um, and here I'm allowing my dad to look back, which is really what this project is largely about um, in a personal and political way. Um, so on that, I would like to thank you guys so much for your attention. Thank you. And I believe that we get to have some questions and question was where is my exhibition showing so thank you for that question um, so the exhibition is titled dear 1968 comma dot 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 um, and it will be shown at UC Davis they just built a brand new museum on that campus which is really great to see a university investing in arts in California uh, the name of the museum is a Minetti Schrem Museum and it opens on April 13th there's information on my website. I know we're a little far from California, but if some folks are from there and know people there, I'd love to have them see the show. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, not really fully formulated yet, but 
I'll shoot with the first one, and that is when, um, when you were gathering this information used for the body of work, did they know what you were going to be using the information for? Definitely not. No, okay. <laughs> um, no I mean, my dad, you know, really initially wanted the information just to know what experiences and personal contact he had with informants. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there was a lot of things that he, you know, f figured or sort of knew, you know, in just basic logic to be uh, FBI involvement, but he really wanted the, the proof and the validation to see the pages for himself. Um, but we definitely didn't mention, you know, anything public ever uh, coming of, of the project, but I knew that, you know, it would likely be a story that I would need to fold into my practice of my work since it's often been concerned with uh, telling my family story as it relates to you know, American history, black families, uh, in a larger, in a larger sense. And I, I'm, I thank you again. I forgot to start with thanking you for a great presentation and such a great body of work. I remember you starting off with mentioning your relatives and saying her name here and the significance of stating her name here. And this space is important. It almost felt like ceremonial or ritualistic in a way, but I don't necessarily want to apply those terms to the archival or to the process of going into the archive, but that's sort of what it felt like. But then aesthetically, I want to ask about the spray paint and the placement of the colors onto the page. And it seemed to kind of relate to the way that you showed the image of your father and the way that it had been photocopied so much and the type and the thing that the photocopying does to a page when you photocopy it so many times. Is that, is, or in, and, then, and then the aesthetic choice to then do it in pink. That's, so if that's a question, could you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a few things at play. You know, one is playing with the graphic elements of the documents themselves. They are very um, graphic. I'm also, my aesthetic tends to be sort of contrasting, uh, you know, negative space or, and a very controlled gesture with a less controlled gesture, which is why I use graphite pencil on one hand and then spray paint on the other, which I think of as almost these opposite materials. The spray paint is so um, unpredictable, but it can also get these very gestural moments um, that sort of read like um, like a, a notation almost. There seems to be like another hidden language to it, which is also something I felt from the marks within the files themselves. So I wanted to mirror that. It's also, uh, I felt like to draw on the pages themselves would be a, a little bit too like, expressionistic maybe, um, but the spray paint has this level of removal from the hand, although it is still from the hand. Um, and then pink, I felt it was again this opposite to the black and white and also, you know, this idea of like girldom um, and, you know, father, daughter and and play and th the power of, of that. Thank you. Any other? Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm Kinshasa Holman Connell. I just, I've been trying to formulate a question because I'm just so overwhelmed by the enormous power of your work. It's extraordinary. It just really is. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I want to commend the organizers too for the brilliance of having your brilliant self here because it is um, not often that that combination of an artist with such incredible gifts does something that's so archival. So in order not to talk for an hour, let me just try to form a question and ask you, and you've talked about it surely a bit, but well, it's really two questions, but you can make it one because you're never supposed to ask two of these things. But one is how did you, how did you navigate that space between the emotional closeness and distance. This was not a person in the movement, this was your father. And also, how do you view yourself? You're clearly an amazing artist, but do you consider yourself an archivist as well? Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yes, it was um, definitely a sort of, I think, me and my father, because he is you know, very much still living and very much a part of this project and a, a collaborator. My mother and my father and I have all, I think, gone through many different phases of looking through the file and sort of coming inside of it and then outside of it and, um, you know, getting really down to the nitty gritty 
detail and being re trying to be rather objective and then taking a step back and think, wow, that, you know, there's an agent following you at the airport um, and just feeling so uh, protective of, you know, my dad as this young, this young man. So it's definitely um, emotional, um, but I also, you know, on the personal level, just feel so lucky that my dad is alive. So I, um, I just feel, feel grateful. A lot of people, their experience with this story um, looks much different. Um, and in terms of turning it into an artwork, I think, you know, really my intention was to sort of frame or reframe the files, the archive, um, not to impede upon it too much, um, but just to direct the sort of thinking and viewing space for the viewer. Um, and I think that's something that often happens in my work is more of a, a pairing, a cutting, a reframing um, rather than a creation. Um, so I just tried to let the, let the source material speak for itself um, and just sort of orchestrate that experience. Anything else? Thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you.